I'm really pleased to be convening this panel. Um, when Angela asked if I would uh, chair it, I looked and saw it was the three people in Washington I'd most like to talk to about Ukrainian energy issues. So that works out exceptionally well for me, and I'll do my best to let other people ask questions too. <laughs> we're, going, <laughs> we're going to begin with Thane Gustafson. Thane is the Senior Director of Research for Eurasia Energy at IHS CIRA, which uh, many of you know as Cambridge Energy Research Associates. Thane has been a leader in the field of energy for a very long time, from his Gorbachev-era book, Crisis Amid Plenty, to his book that came out two years ago called Wheel of Fortune. He really is a master of both the technical aspects of energy the politics of energy as it's played in Russia, and the economics. And I'm very pleased to report that he's currently writing on a book about gas, where he examines the conflicting paradigms of where Europe thinks it's going with gas, where Russia thinks it's going, and how Germany and Ukraine, in very different ways, are the linchpins in the middle. Um, Thane? Well, thank you very much, Teresa, for that very generous introduction. Um, I was, my mission was to talk about Russia as the setting, as the context for then uh, Ukraine in particular and uh, U.S.-Ukrainian uh, energy relations and policy. Uh, so I'd like to make three points about Russia and about Gazprom. Uh, the first is that Gazprom is a very conservative business in a sector that is in worldwide revolution. And it's important to understand the contrast between those two things uh, to get a sense of where Gazprom is going and where it's not going. Uh, the second point is that despite an overall conservative mindset and a conservative skill set, uh, Gazprom has been extremely entrepreneurial and successful, particularly in its, the expansion of its business into Europe and particularly Germany in the last 25 years. Uh, you might say that Gazprom has a left brain and a right brain. We focus a lot on the right brain. That is to say Gazprom is an instrument of foreign policy, but one mustn't overlook the left brain, which is very important, uh, and that is Gazprom as a, uh, as a corporation with a business model and a bottom line. And uh, third, the third point, which is really then the setting and the transition to the Russian-Ukrainian issues, um, Gazprom has had a very coherent policy for handling transportation risk. The name of the policy is diversification, and it has been practicing that policy quite consistently and energetically for the last 20 years. Uh, the last uh, piece in that edifice is South Stream, and so I'll close with South Stream. That's a good, way, good place to hand off uh, to my teammates. So first, on the sector in revolution, the gas industry really is in revolution worldwide. Uh, if you think about the technological aspects, it's uh, LNG. LNG is not a new story, but LNG continues to evolve as a story. Uh, liquefaction is becoming, much, is becoming steadily more efficient. Costs are coming down. We have uh, liquefaction on shipboard and all sorts of things uh, so that um, uh, we are seeing for the first time, really, a global market in gas emerging in what was traditionally a uh, series of regional markets. And that's really changing the name of the game. Uh, the revolution is even more apparent in the area of unconventional gas. Who would have guessed 10 years ago that the United States would be self-sufficient uh, in natural gas? This came as a complete surprise. Uh, and, of course, it's possible to trumpet that this just shows American superiority and technological innovation and so on. But it really comes down to one stubborn man, George Mitchell, uh, who happened to be of Greek origin. I suppose that's relevant. Uh, but in any case, uh, it was very much a combination of things that were, very much, were made in America, but very much a case of individual enterprise and stubbornness and just demonstrates how contingent these things are. Uh, at any rate, an unconventional revolution in, uh, in natural gas that is spreading throughout the world from its origins in the United States. Uh, the most important uh, aspect of this revolution, however, is in Europe, 
uh, because what we are seeing is a change, a revolutionary change in the way that gas is traded, in the way that gas is regulated. And uh, that affects very much the business of Gazprom. The irony here is that Gazprom remains conservative in the sense that they adhere still, for the most part, to the business model developed in the 40s, 50s, and 60s during the first generation of the gas industry. Uh, this was a business model that uh, rested on the idea that gas is a risky business with heavy financial outlays. You build pipelines that, you, you, that go on for half a century. Uh, therefore, you need to manage risk. And so this business model was designed with those thoughts in mind. Uh, the oil indexation, uh, for example, the idea that the owner of the pipeline and the owner of the gas are one and the same. Uh, the um, uh, long-term take-or-pay contracts, as they're referred to. All of these are the uh, staples, the mainstays of the gas industry as it first grew up. Gazprom continues to adhere to those. The rest of the global gas industry, and particularly in Europe, is moving on to a free market model in which gas is traded on hubs. Uh, this is so, how should I say, uncomfortable, or has been for Gazprom, uh, until recently that uh, Alexander Medvedev, uh, the uh, uh, former head of Gazprom Export and still deputy chairman of Gazprom, once exclaimed when he was confronted with the more revolutionary aspects of, of this, the so-called third package, he, he spluttered in indignation and finally he blurted out, but, but, but this is communism. But this is communism. So here we have a Gazprom that sticks to an older business model, is gradually adapting. And this leads me back to my second point, which is that Gazprom in its way has been highly entrepreneurial. It took a relationship that had begun with Germany uh, in the 1960s and turned it into an alliance uh, with the biggest chemical company in Europe, BASF, whose gas company, Ventosal, uh, was um, looking for a partner because BASF was so mad at the previous German monopoly uh, over uh, the high prices that were being charged for gas. What they did together had no precedent in the European gas industry. Uh, BASF and Gazprom together built a $5 billion gas transmission system on spec without a single client. Now that's entrepreneurship for you. Of course, it helped to have BASF's deep pockets, but never mind. This was, this was an achievement. And Gazprom, in a number of ways, has pioneered uh, new ventures. Gazprom Marketing and Trading in London is another example. So um, I'll, I can come back and we can talk more about that. But let me turn now to the, the third aspect, which is the one that brings us closer to Ukraine. When we talk about the Russian-Ukrainian gas problem, we have to bear in mind that initially there was no Russian-Ukrainian gas problem. The gas complex was created as a single complex that, was, that united the uh, production of the gas and the transportation of the gas and then brought it to the western border. The problem arose, of course, as a byproduct of the breakup of the Soviet Union. And suddenly you've got the gas produced in one place Trans transported through another. Ukraine has no gas. They need the gas, but what they do have is transit. Each holds the other by an essential asset, and the result is the uncomfortable situation that we see today. Um, Gazprom's reaction to this, however, from the mid-1990s on has been to bypass the Ukrainian problem through a series of pipelines. Think of Blue Stream already at a very early stage, which of course reached out to open up a new market in Turkey for Gazprom. It also blocked gas from Turkmenistan, but its core mission, I suspect, was to bypass Ukraine. Then we have Yamal Europe pipeline. Then we have Blue Stream. And finally, we have, have, have South Stream. The dependence of Gazprom on Ukrainian transit is now at about 50%. Uh, if South Stream is built, that Ukrainian leverage over Gazprom's transit through uh, to Europe will be uh, greatly reduced, maybe down to the teens or the single digits. 
Now, what made this possible, however, and this is a crucial point for the future, what made this possible was that Gazprom came into the post-Soviet period with practically unlimited gas rents, legacy rents. And those rents are now fading away. At a time when Gazprom has major new commitments to finance the turn to the east and other missions, and consequently, South Stream is not as easily built or financed, particularly in, this, in the age of sanctions, as might have been previously the case. So South Stream, I think, has become a question mark. I think from the beginning, Gazprom would have liked to buy the Ukrainian pipeline system if they had thought that they could make a, a, a deal uh, and that it would be abided by. So South Stream, I would direct your attention to, is really the pivot question for the future on whether the bypass policy will be uh, pursued to its ultimate conclusion uh, or whether Ukrainian, uh, Ukraine will retain some leverage and will that, I'll turn the microphone over, over to my teammates. Thank you very much. It's now my pleasure to introduce Ambassador Carlos Pascual. Um, he is currently um, and newly at the Center for Global Energy Policy at Columbia University, where he is the fellow and senior researcher. Uh, but he comes to Columbia after a long career in government service. He was our ambassador to Mexico. He was our ambassador to Ukraine. He was the ambassador who was the founding member of the Office of Energy Diplomacy um, and just completed his term in that office in September. Um, he is uh, he's published extensively on energy issues and is currently working on a book on e energy security and international relations in which Ukraine will be one of his cases. Please. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Angela. Thanks for uh, continuing to hold up the torch and bring us all together around these issues as well. I really appreciate it. Um, so. Uh, Thane has done a terrific job of setting st stage or perspectives from Russia. Let's move then the scene over west a little bit to Ukraine. Um, one of the things that's important to start out from any discussion about energy and Ukraine is a recognition that energy has been the principal source of corruption in Ukraine since its independence. And who has been able to steal that energy? principally related to the gas system, has had a dominant hand in the economics and the politics of the country, and who has been able to wield power over the last 20 years. And so the issue for Ukraine is, at, the issue at hand is one of international stability, but it's also a question of its own national sovereignty and its ability to rule with transparency. And so it has a huge opportunity in front of it right now to change the course of the past. But it will require a phenomenal effort from internally, internally from within Ukraine and not just from the outside. There are two sets of issues that are preoccupying us right now. Obviously, the immediate question of the crisis, the energy crisis in Ukraine, as a result of the fact that in June of this year, Russia stopped shipping gas to Ukraine. And then there's the longer term issue of the Ukraine's energy system. And as Eric Rubin indicated at lunchtime, the issues and the challenges of energy efficiency are a core part of that. But in order to be able to understand how to, be, how to deal and address these issues effectively, let's go back for a second and pick up on one of the points that Thane laid out which is the emergence and the development of the European gas market, because it's absolutely critical to understand that, to figure out any solution around Ukraine as well. So since the Russia-Ukraine gas wars in 2008, 2009, Europe has made phenomenal changes in its own internal system. It's invested in regasification terminals. It's built gas interconnectors across countries. It had a whole series of changes in its policy and regulatory structures, which it called the third energy package. And as a result of these measures, one of the things that's happened is that no individual company, i.e. Gazprom, can own the gas, can own the transit system, and own the distribution system within a country. There's a competitive market. 
In addition to that, we operate in an environment where the country that actually buys the gas has the right to sell it to whomever it wants. Previously, there used to be what are called destination clauses that said that if Germany, for example, purchased the gas, Germany would have to get the permission of Gazprom in order to be able to resell that. That is no longer the case, and understanding that is absolutely critical to the future. The other piece that's key here is what Thane outlined about the gas revolution in the United States. Because even though the United States is still not in a position of exporting gas, we're importing very little LNG. And as a result of that, about 75 billion cubic meters of gas that we're going to be coming into the United States have been redirected in international markets. And Europe has been a beneficiary of that at times and created a degree of competition in the European market that has given Western European consumers a market capacity and a market power that they previously did not have. All right. So when we look at solutions for Ukraine, the critical things that we have to come back to are how to take the rules of that market for 400 million people and extend them to the market of 42 million people in Ukraine and embrace Ukraine in it rather than Ukraine approach this on its own. And the key rules here are one, that the market sets the price, two, that if you buy the gas you get to trade it, and three, and here's an obligation for Ukraine, that if you use the gas, you actually have to pay for it. All right? So eventually, you've got to come back to the question of repaying debt. But you have to understand that framework, because if you don't have that framework in mind, you can't fix and you can't address the Ukrainian situation in and of itself. So what are the critical pieces of it? First, let's understand the scale. In the past, Ukraine consumed about 50 billion cubic meters of gas a year. 28 of that came from Russia, 20 of it was produced domestically, about two of it came westward from Poland principally as a result of the changes that started to happen in the European market that allows for the so-called reverse flows of some of the gas to be sold in, in a sense backwards through the system. Today, the situation that we have is sadly not because of energy efficiency but because of the war. Ukraine is probably going to consume about 42 billion cubic meters of gas. It is still producing about 20. The reverse flows, they're going to get the benefit of about 7, but they've increased that to a rate of about 10 eventually. But 7 what is what they'll benefit from. So let's take 42, subtract 27, gives us 15 that they have to fill. Out of that, they have about 15 billion cubic meters in storage, 10 of that they can actually use, so 10 of that we can subtract out. So it gives us a magical number of 5 billion cubic meters, and so now you understand why the gas deal that was just negotiated between Russia and Ukraine was negotiated around 4 to 5 billion cubic meters of gas because it is what Ukraine absolutely needs to be able to get through the gas system to the other side at a point in time when its own consumption diminishes and it can start building up its gas stores. All right, so where are we in this process and is the gas deal going to hold? I think one of the things that I will note is just a, a contrasting example from June of this past year. The European Union was hosting the negotiations between Russia and Ukraine. And in June, there was an agreement on the table to be picked up and signed. Ukraine said it would abide by it. Russia said it would not. The excuse at that time was that Ukraine needed to be forth, more forthcoming on paying debt. But the reality is that Ukraine had just paid $750 million the week before. They were going to pay $1.1 billion the day after. And the critical sticking point at that time was that Ukraine insisted on a new contract which is mutually binding on both parties and not an amendment to the 2009 gas agreement that was signed by Yulia Tymoshenko. And the reason for that was that the price of gas in that agreement was $485 per thousand cubic meters with discounts. And the last discount was for the Black Sea Fleet. 
And of course, Russia now says they don't need to pay that discount because they own Crimea. So politically, for Ukrainian politicians, it became virtually impossible for them to say that they would abide by that, that old formula. It was that disagreement which blew this agreement apart. So on October 30th, the EU once again hosts a negotiation. An agreement is reached for 5 billion cubic meters. Ukraine did not get exactly what it wanted. The 2009 agreement is still a reference point. Ironically, the price of gas is now much lower because of decreases in international oil prices. And in that agreement in 2009, gas at that point was actually linked to the price of oil. So it gave Ukraine a price of 378, right now projected to go to 367 after January. In order to implement it, one of the mechanisms for reaching that price was that Gazprom had to secure with the Russian government a decree which would allow it to waive the export duties on gas going to Ukraine. So where do we have thus far? We have a signed agreement. That decree has actually been issued. Today, Gazprom began paying for its transit fees for gas that's going through Ukraine. Ukraine has paid the first installment for the debt that is owed um, for Russian gas. So it paid a, um, close to about $1.5 billion. And Ukraine still has not ordered the delivery of gas for which it has to prepay. And how it's going to finance those prepayments is still a question that is being resolved. The point of this is that there is agree an agreement that can hold. There is a reason for it to hold. Gazprom gets paid. Ukraine gets gas. Ukraine, Europe gets greater stability and greater assurance of supply. There's one other piece of this equation that I should have mentioned earlier that I want to come back to, which is the, the scale of the volumes that are flowing through Ukraine and into Europe. So Europe consumes about 480 billion cubic meters of gas. About 160 billion, a third of it, comes from Russia. And about half of that goes through Ukraine, all right, just to give you a sense of the scale. So for Europe, it's a Gazprom in Russia is a huge supplier. But here's the interesting thing on the story of diversification that Thane was talking about. It was diversification of gas supply going to Europe, a market that was shrinking, where, Ukraine, where Russia already has 220 billion cubic meters worth of pipeline capacity, and it's thinking of adding another 40 to 50, depending on what variant of, of South Stream was actually added, OK? And so the interesting issue here is that Russia also has no options. They have 14 billion cubic meters of gas export capacity out of, a, out of um, Sakhalin in LNG to Asia. They signed a 38 billion cubic meter agreement with China but that's not going to reach full capacity for another decade. And so the point here is that Europe and Ukraine associating itself with Europe do potentially have market power. And it's in the interest of all of the parties um, on the Western side between Europe and Ukraine to use that market power to be able to leverage a set of agreements and conditions in, able, in being able to move forward. So let me come back to then a couple of additional points that I think are key. It's possible to get through the short term and manage the coming winter. But the short term strategy only makes sense if you understand where you're going in the long term and how, do you, how you reduce Ukraine's dependence on a single supplier of gas. And here, Ukraine has possibilities. But this is one of the big challenges that the new government is going to face. First of all, there is significant unconventional gas in Ukraine. Exactly how much, we don't know. Contracts have been signed with Chevron and Shell. 
But those contracts have not really been fully brought into effect because Ukraine hasn't had the capacity to put together the teams to implement some very basic things such as the taxation provisions and the banking requirements in order to make them function. So a critical issue for the new government coming in is how to make available the skills and the expertise on an interagency basis that is necessary to take advantage of that. Second thing is to take advantage of Ukraine's conventional gas resources. As I said, they produce about 20 billion cubic meters a year. They've been doing that for almost the last 40 years. They've been using the same technology for the last 40 years. And we know that there are significant deposits that can be developed or redeveloped that would give Ukraine quite significant capacity. There are different estimates of how much gas Ukraine could produce. But a lot of people in the industry don't think it's outrageous that they can add another 10 BCM. And some don't think it's outrageous that they can double from 20 to 40. That is the goal that you have to think about over the next 20 years. And then the other piece of this is energy efficiency. And on energy efficiency, the big issue here is not technical. There have been billions of dollars that have been spent on energy efficiency on Ukraine. The problem has been that with the subsidized price of gas, it's been virtually impossible to translate that energy efficiency into a cash flow of savings. And so if you can't translate it into a cash flow of savings, you don't have a mechanism to be able to self-finance the investments in energy efficiency in the future, whether that's a business or a municipality. So the challenge today is to translate energy efficiency with the reforms that Ukraine has committed to, to create a cash flow that allows this to be expanded. I'm going to stop there. Um, I'm going to highlight one problem we should, which we should probably talk about, which is that Ukraine's got a power problem right now because of the war and the lack of coal coming out of the Donbass region. But there's another piece of this that I just want to leave you with. Today, Ukraine does have an opportunity an opportunity by associating itself with a European market to put in place the norms, the procedures, and the policies that allow the integration of its gas system with Europe, that allow it to be a more productive entity, and that deals with the issues related to efficiency and corruption that have plagued Ukraine since its, since its independence. And if it can do those things, then it can create the rationale for why gas should continue to flow through the Ukrainian transit system, why it makes no sense to invest in another pipeline like South Stream. But unless Ukraine takes the responsible actions to do that, we can try to help. We are trying to help, but we can't make it work unless there is a full partnership. And that is a challenge that the new government's going to have to face. Thank you. All right. Um, we, Ed Chow volunteered to be last and do cleanup. Um, Ed comes to us um, from CSIS. Um, he is a senior fellow in the Energy and National Security Program at CSIS. He came to CSIS after 30 years in the industry um, and is superb at explaining technical and political issues in layman's terms. If you'd like to see some more of Ed, I would recommend you can see um, he, get, he did a commentary on CSIS on the website on October 31st on um, the Russia-Ukraine gas deal and its significance. And I, I wonder, was that because it was the scariest thing you could think of for Halloween? Or, uh, <laughs> but we're very fortunate to um, have him join us to explain. The Russians and the Ukrainians ch chose the date, not me. Um, <laughs> Uh, if it weren't for the last minute, nothing would ever get done on the Russian-Ukraine gas deals. Um, I, I told Teresa that uh, everything I know about Russia and Ukraine, I learned from Thane and Carlos. So after Dave talked, there will be very little for me to say. Um, as I recall, Thane started his Soviet studies in Kiev. Wasn't that true? And, and Carlos was ambassador there when I made my first trip to, to Ukraine when I think Mr. Kuchma mistook me for the new Chinese ambassador. <laughs> um, 
And so, so uh, I've, I've been working at this for a while. I'm not sure that there's too much to add uh, uh, to what um, Thane and Carlos have already said, uh, but since uh, Teresa and Angela insist, I would try. Uh, in order to provoke you a little bit in the uh, conversation that I hope that we will have uh, following. Um, the first point I would want to like to make is that Europe is not going to diversify away from Russian gas. In spite of all the loose talk in this town and, and elsewhere, that's just not going to happen. It makes too much sense for both sides, it makes too much economic sense. And any other alternative would be at a tremendous economic cost to both Russia and Europe, and therefore it's not going to happen. Uh, I analogize it to the Venezuelan-U.S. Uh, crude and refining relationship. Uh, they don't like us. We don't care for them much, but we are still the largest export destination for Venezuelan crude, and we continue to buy Venezuelan crude because otherwise you would leave just too much money on, on the table. So, so that's not going to happen. It's really, the issue really is the commercial terms of that trade and the rules and regulations under which they are, are going to operate, which is uh, what Carlos mentioned. Um, the second point I'd like to make is that given uh, that uh, Russia will uh, continue to be a major supplier of gas to Europe, the importance of Ukraine as, as a transit corridor, uh, which has also been referenced. Uh, Ukraine used to transit 80% of the gas that um, um, uh, Russia sold to Europe. It now transits about half the gas uh, that, that uh, Russia uh, sells to Europe. Uh, I would say uh, to Thane that uh, that diversification strategy of, of Russia is of long standing, first with oil, uh, where Ukraine also used to transit about a million barrels per day uh, through Ukrainian pipes and, and ports to export markets. And, and that, you know, so the, the gas. Uh, bypass pipeline uh, picture is just part of a larger picture that uh, Russia ha has um, uh, followed uh, ever since the breakup of the Soviet Union. So if you uh, think of the, the fi first bypass pipeline was actually a bypass of Ukrainian territory for the pipeline to Nova Rusisk. That was the first thing that the Russians did and followed by you can think of the, both the Baltic Pipeline System 1 and 2 and uh, the East Siberia Pacific Ocean Pipeline as Ukraine bypass pipelines. That's one way of thinking of it. So to dissuade Mr. Putin or whoever's in charge in Moscow from building South Stream uh, is going to be a, a pretty her Herculean task, um, I, I think, and we can discuss that a little bit more um, uh, later on. Um, but. The fact of the matter is that Russia and Ukraine are kind of stuck with each other for the next five years. Uh, there is no substitute for the Ukrainian route for if Russia continues to want to uh, sell about 160 BCM or so of gas uh, to, to Europe, in spite of all the things that you might hear. Now, South Stream's not going to appear tomorrow. It may or may not appear in five years, but it's not going to appear tomorrow. Uh, in spite of the noise about a, yet another China gas deal that was signed, uh, a memorandum of understanding that was signed yesterday in Beijing, uh, Russia is not going to diversify its gas exports to China anytime soon. The last time they signed an MOU, uh, it took them 10 years to negotiate the, the, the final deal, which we think is final, but we're not sure. It was signed in, in May in, 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 in Shanghai. So it's stabilizing the, uh, the, uh, both the gas supply and transit relationship between Russia and Ukraine is, is really very important to both sides, and, and they don't have much of a choice there, in spite of the last minute brinksmanship that they seem to like to play. Um, another point I'd like to make, and which uh, Carlos has already made, is that transit is, has been in the center of energy corruption in Ukraine, but it's not the only place that it happens. Uh, it happens in coal, it happens in uh, nuclear, uh, it happens in domestic gas with differential pricing between domestic uh, gas prices and imported gas prices, uh, and as they say in this part of the world, it, it no, it's not an accident that you have a system that's really optimized for corruption. 
uh, in, in Ukraine. And the current Ukrainian leaders are very familiar with this. After all, Mr. Poroshenko uh, was part of the Orange government and the infighting within the Orange government um, on uh, the energy franchise, if you will, between the Timoshenko forces and the Yushchenko forces were, was directly led to the, dis the, the disappointing results that that uh, government was able or not able to, to achieve. Uh, Mr. Yaksenuk was both economy minister and foreign minister uh, during the Orange government. Um, so they're very familiar uh, with, with the way the game used to be played. Uh, Mr. Prodong, the energy minister, was deputy energy minister in January 2006 when the not very good deal that Yushchenko agreed to was signed and he was minister in January um, 2009 when Timoshenko signed the ill-fated deal with Putin. So um, they know what they're dealing with. And, and what's been disappointing, I would say, of the transitional government is the lack of an articulation of what a reform policy on energy really is. We really haven't seen that to, for people who should know the facts and claim that they want to be on a reform path, we haven't heard very much. Now maybe this will be, be different with a new government, with a new mandate after the RADA elections on October 26. Uh, it's disappointingly slow, the coalition building, I would say. The latest word is that there will be a coalition agreement on December 1. Well, we will see. Uh, and, and a government formed before the end of the year. But, you know, it is really urgent for the new Ukrainian government to tackle the energy sector right away. And I think you know, listening to, to, to Eric Rubin uh, at lunchtime earlier, it seems to me that the best deterrent against whatever plans Russia has for Ukraine is to th strengthen uh, uh, Ukraine internally. And, and certainly the energy sector is, is a part that, that needs reform desperately. Uh, another point I would make is that in order to reform both the new Ukrainian government and any other, you know, uh, any Western assistance that may be forthcoming on energy uh, sector reform needs to engage the Ukrainian public on discussing these critical matters. And we haven't seen that very much either. Um, I think the, what Euromaidan should have demonstrated to us is that the strength of the Ukrainian nation up until now has been in its people and not its elected leaders, at least up until now. Uh, maybe it will be different uh, in the future. But uh, you know, if the Ukrainian uh, government is sincere about reform in the uh, energy sector, then it needs to engage its public and, and explain why certain steps need to be taken. It needs to formulate a plan with an order of battle on what the near-term steps are as well as the long-term steps are. Frankly, the what steps the transitional government have made uh, in the last few months have been backwards rather than forwards. Increasing taxes on domestic gas production, uh, dictating the terms under which domestic gas is going to be traded. Uh, these are not uh, confidence builders for investors uh, that, that may be considering. So Western strategy itself needs, it seems to me, on the energy sector be informed by a realistic assessment of the fact, of the true facts, and not by wishful thinking. Uh, if Ukraine is committed to reform in the uh, energy sphere, then it will definitely require technical assistance, financial resources, but also the West holding the Ukrainian government to account for the actions that it claims it wants to, 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 to take. And with that, I will uh, hope to engage all of you in a conversation. Um. We've got a good range of issues here. And, it, and the thing that we hear echoing throughout um, actually all the presentations today is it would be a shame if Ukraine wastes a good crisis. Um, but there is a lot that needs to be um, sorted and resorted here. Um, I would like to ask, before we open it up to everybody else, if you could comment on 
the European reaction right now, because in part, uh, Europe's been quite panicked about its own gas deficit without Ukraine. Um, some of the proposals that have come out, including the, the TOSP proposal, which suggests that all of Europe should buy gas as a block together, um, is Europe doing what Ukraine needs or not? Maybe, um, uh, let me start off on this because um, it's a topic that I've spent a lot of time on with the uh, European Commission um, uh, in my previous uh, incarnation as coordinator for international energy affairs. Um, for Europe, um, I should say, first of all, I think Europe has been a critical and important player. Um, Europe is also at a transition point. Um, there's a new European Commission, and one of the question marks is who's going to demonstrate leadership on Ukraine within that new Commission. So um, a, a critical piece of this has been the role of the Energy Commission within, um, within the European Union. The Energy Commission has been central to hosting all of the negotiations between Russia and Ukraine. Commissioner Ettinger, who was there until October 31st and now is a vice president of the commission, but has moved over to a new portfolio, personally was engaged in every single nitty gritty bit of these discussions from pulling in the energy ministers from Ukraine and Russia um, discussions with the CEOs of Gazprom and Naftagas, meeting with the respective prime ministers and on the Ukrainian side, the Ukrainian president as well, to try to create the conditions for a deal. I don't think that there would have been an agreement reached between Ukraine and Russia if the European Commission had not play that, played that role, and they deserve appropriate credit for, for doing that. There's a wider issue about where Europe is going in the future. Um, Europe published in June, um, and it was reviewed by the European Council, the highest body of the European Union, a European Union energy security strategy. Um, that energy security strategy talks about a whole series of measures of, um, and I, I would say diversification, not to end imports of gas, from Russia, but potentially to diversify them with um, potentially other options that could come through LNG, through Algeria, um, Libya, if it were ever reliable, uh, more from Norway. And there are other international sources of LNG as we move, as Thane was saying earlier, to that global um, nature of a gas market. But then diversification in other fuel supplies, including what's going to happen with nuclear, what's going to happen in the European trading system for carbon, and what are the implications for how coal is going to be used in that system. The relationship between coal and gas is really important to understand, and it has a big impact on renewables as well. The reason I mention this is that there's a big question mark that everybody sees on how Europe is going to take this strategy that was passed by the previous commission and council, and is it going to be upheld, and will it move forward with the new team that is there? So there's a question of political leadership and engagement on the part of the European Union and Ukraine. Who is going to be the center point of those negotiations? On energy, it was Commissioner Ettinger. Will it continue to be the European Commission, and at what level? And on a political and policy basis in the past, it was a combination of the, um, Michael, I don't remember the right title, the Nationalities uh, um, Commissioner, Stefan Fule, um, together with um, actually President Barroso, who had a, a personal interest in these issues. And who's going to take, take up the political charge in the future? Those are really critical issues that, you, that Europe has to answer both for its relationship with Ukraine, but also for its own European energy security strategy for the future. Thane, did you want to add anything to that? Yes, just to uh, embroider a bit on uh, what Ambassador Pasquale has said, uh, one of the difficulties in um, European energy policy is that uh, Europe 
it's often said, this is a, a, a cliche, I suppose, but it's, it, it captures, I think, a central element. Europe has not one energy policy, it has three. Uh, the three objectives of European energy policy have been competitiveness, sustainability, and security. And this poses two problems. One is that the uh, rank order of these three objectives tends to shift depending on the state of the market, depending on the latest international episodes, the, the, uh, the, the climate, the political climate, the economic climate. At various times, uh, security came first in the wake of the uh, oil shocks, for example, and so forth. Uh, the second difficulty is that even within the commission structure, these three objectives tend to be represented by three separate bodies. And so uh, the ambassador has mentioned uh, the role of Oettinger and the uh, energy uh, uh, directorate general. But at the same time, alongside that, there is a very powerful general directorate for competition. And indeed, in, in many respects, that competition directorate is, is more powerful than the energy uh, directorate because it has enforcement powers. Uh, DG Comp, as it is called, uh, can knock down your front door if you're a business, and it can haul away your computers, and it can confiscate your documents, and it can even arrest people. Uh, that is indeed what DG Comp did in a series of what have come to be called the Dawn Raids three years ago uh, on Gazprom. And Gazprom, of course, was fit to be tied, but nevertheless, there wasn't anything Gazprom could do about it. And DG Comp hauled away truckloads of documents and has been studying them ever since and is very likely. Uh, within the coming year to bring forward a series of complaints. And those complaints then lead directly to a, through a long legal process, but at the end of the day, they can lead to multi-billion dollar fines. And this is something that tends to be driven on the momentum of the administrative power that DG Comp has, a very powerful uh, legal entity. Competition law is possibly the most advanced, elaborate, toughest, uh, body of commission legislation, and in many ways it trumps the other objectives of European energy policy. So as you read, for example, about the disputes surrounding South Stream uh, and the disputes uh, surrounding the application of the so-called third package, in other words, the things that have really caused a lot of heartburn uh, on uh, Gazprom's side and on the side of Gazprom's partners. Why? Those are going to continue to be pushed by the competition directorate. And so the real answer to the question, I think, is how and by what means can Europe coordinate these different objectives and, and uh, get them into a single coherent policy? And that's just the commission. And then we get to the nation states, but I'll leave that to someone else. Uh, I agree with much. Uh, of what has already been said. Let, let me just add, add that uh, I think the Commission has yet to fill in the blanks of what having a energy union really means, m much less having a vice president for the energy union. Um, and, and frankly, the idea of a bias club makes absolutely no sense in the commercial world. Um, after all, the EU doesn't buy gas, European companies buy gas, and their contracts all come due at different times. The desire for the term of the contract, uh, the clauses in, in, in the contract, uh, their power of negotiations based on their, their credit history and, 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 and other factors, the volume that they want to buy, are all very different. So you know, the idea of a buyer's union uh, for gas in Europe, that does sound like communism, doesn't it, thing? Um, uh, so I, so I, I think we're still waiting to hear what it means uh, in, under the new commission to have the so-called energy union for Europe. Questions? Keith, go ahead. I'm just wondering, could you describe that system in brief uh, so that we have a general sense of what the contours of that look like? Are we on the air? 
<laughs> when, when do you want to visit next time? Uh, uh, generally speaking, I, th I think it's very simple, actually. Uh, it used to be based on, on, on Gazprom buying near broad gas for cheap and selling it to the far broad deer, uh, mainly Turkmen gas. Um, and and the, uh, the, the rent that gets extracted through that trade magically don't appear in the bottom line of e either Gazprom or Naftahaz, but goes into certain people's pockets through middlemen companies, and there's been a series of them. That game ended in 2009 when Gazprom agreed to pay uh, Turkmenistan basically European net back pricing uh, for purchase of, of the gas, which is why the gas price all of a sudden seemed to have jumped up because that game was over and, and yet uh, 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 there are Ukrainians who, uh, uh, who continue to want to extend that business model uh, for longer. So part of it now is the differentiation between, um, I'm sorry that Anders le left because he keeps track of domestic gas prices much closer than I do. But, but let's say you buy uh, imported gas as $378. I think it's the latest number, and, 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 but you can only sell domestic gas prices at $40. That's the regulated pr uh, 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 price in, in Ukraine. Well, if, if you set up a system like that, I know a few people who can convert $40 gas to $300 gas very quickly, uh, and they tend to be your, you know, your cousin or, or your closest associates who get hold of cheap gas. So that game continues, but it's not the only thing. Uh, uh, refined product imports is another um, uh, uh, favorite way of tax avoidance um, uh, uh, as well as uh, uh, corruption in, in the energy sector. And, and that's holds through, as, as I say, gas is just one example of, of many different schemes that have been operating in, in Ukraine for a long, long time. The wonderful thing about um, uh, corruption, energy corruption in this part of the world is that it's totally transparent. Everyone knows about it. Everyone knows, you know, who's doing it. Everyone knows that billions of dollars get siphoned off e e every year. All you have to do is a ask a taxi driver in Kiev and he'll tell you. Yeah. Let me just add a, a couple of things about the domestic side of it and the, the international part Ed hit on well and just to give a little bit more of a flavor for the domestic side, right? So the whole theory of um, having lower gas prices for domestic production was that a certain number of companies would be, um, um, that were producing domestically would be given a lower price for the gas that they produce. And they would sell that gas to municipalities. And so if you were getting paid $40 um, per, thousand cubic meters, you sold it on to municipalities for use for public purposes at a subsidized price. The issue then became though that since you had other parts of the economy, the industrial sector which had already been deregulated and were paying a market price of say 400, then there was obviously this huge incentive of taking that $40 gas and selling it at the 400 price, and the municipalities never managed to actually get the subsidized gas to begin with, which then created a whole series of fiscal liabilities, which then became the foundation for why gas became the biggest source of deficit in the Ukrainian budget. Right? So until you fix those problems on gas pricing and who has authority to be able to develop and trade and buy gas at differential prices, you're gonna end up with gas as a major source of corruption. And that's why it's so important that Ukraine committed last April, May with the IMF to begin phasing out the subsidies and to target subsidies at a household level for needy households rather than making it a blanket subsidy for the entire economy. That process is moving forward, but frankly, to get momentum, you're going to need a new government there and the political will of a new government to really drive it in order to be effective. Thanks. 
In addition to what's been said, uh, it's interesting to ask an economist uh, what uh, corruption means when translated into economic terms. Uh, and I would offer two market uh, redef right? exactly <laughs> redef two redefinitions of the word corruption. Uh, one is, uh, you might say, uh, informal monetization, uh, which is which was particularly relevant in the former Soviet Union for the first, uh, say, 15 years, uh, in the sense that um, both Turkmenistan and uh, Gazprom had uh, more gas than they knew what to do with. Developed fields, developed pipelines, uh, a limit to which you could sell for real money into Europe, and consequently the name of the game was somehow to turn that gas into value, uh, something that could ultimately at the end of the chain be bankable. Now, where it was bankable, of course, was an interesting question, but as an economic phenomenon, that was the name of the game. By the way, it wasn't just Turkmenistan. Take, for example, the Hantu Mansisk, uh, the Yamal Ninyats uh, Okru government. Uh, they were paid taxes by Gazprom, but of course Gazprom didn't pay those taxes in money. It paid those taxes in gas. So what was the Yamal Ninyats government supposed to do with all that gas? Well, it was at that point that various helpful people stepped forward and said, look, I can take that gas off your hands and I can uh, work my magic uh, through uh, a, a chain with a dozen links and part of that will end up in a Swiss bank account. Uh, but at the end of the day, you'll get your tax revenue uh, for Yamal Ninyet. So you could argue that these people were performing a useful function. So informal monetization. The other was what you might call recycling of rents, and that's basically the same idea, uh, <coughs> given that you had the, the tremendous legacy rents left over from the Soviet period. Now the key point is, though, that the game has moved on, the world has moved on, and um, the, uh, these economies are now essentially re-monetized, so they've become much more conventional. Uh, and also those rents have disappeared because the legacy uh, uh, gas has largely been produced and consumed. So that means you're in a different ball game. And I think it's revealing that one of the most successful of those helpful intermediaries, uh, someone who's now in uh, uh, residence in uh, Vienna, and, and, and uh, you'll, you'll know who I'm talking about, um, has actually uh, changed jobs. He, uh, for the last several years, he's no longer been an intermediary. Uh, he's been a gas consumer uh, through his extensive holdings in the uh, fertilizer industry. Uh, so that niche has effectively disappeared and has been replaced with more conventional niches. What I'm really driving at here, I think, is the most interesting part of this whole business, and that is that this really dodgy series of relationships um, is a byproduct of the Soviet uh, period and the dislocations of the Soviet period. And uh, I think that um, um, uh, both of uh, my, my fellow speakers are perfectly correct in saying that five or ten years from now, the sources of these problems will have largely disappeared. Yes, please. European Commission for many, many years. Just one comment uh, and then a question. Uh, the new commission, I think one is likely to see still the competition commissioner playing a, a critical role. As you may know, the post has been taken over by uh, Margarita Vestager, who was formerly the Danish uh, deputy prime minister and minister of the economy, and seems likely to play a prominent role and to be fairly tough on all these issues. The other two players are the Spanish Commissioner for Energy, Mr. Cagnette, and uh, the Vice President for, for, for Energy Union, uh, Shevchevich, who's uh, from Slovakia. This is his third term um, in, in the Commission. Now, how this plays out between them remains to be seen. But um, Shevchevich has the responsibility for what is now being called Energy Union that I interpret to mean mainly implementation of the third package, and particularly um, supporting infrastructure uh, investment to, to build those uh, interconnectors. But exactly how this plays out between them remains to be seen. But my question comes back to South Stream and, as it were, the bottom line on South Stream. Ed and I were not so long ago, a few months ago, at a conference in Torino where um, a German speaker who uh, happens to be uh, rather close also to any 
got up and said that South Stream is the best means to strengthen Europe's energy security. And uh, at the time, I thought this was really crazy. But he said, of course, what he meant really was that um, supplies to Europe should no longer be dependent on the perennial uh, quarrels between Ukraine and, and Russia. And Ed pointed out in his recent article that this is the fifth such uh, deal. So who knows what, uh, wh where it's going. But how should we, in fact, think about this? And to what extent is the dependency such as it is on a somewhat declining curve translated politically? Is there really any evidence that this energy dependence, so to speak, translates into a lack of foreign policy independence? And secondly, is there any substance to the view that Europe's energy security would be stronger and safer uh, through this bypass strategy, which Russia is pursuing for its own purposes? Six member states are strongly supporting this project. Where is it going and what would its impact be on Europe's energy security in the end? Michael, I, I'm going to let my fellow, fellow panelists answer your difficult question, but, but let me ask you one. Do, do you expect the statement of objections from the Competition Bureau on Gazprom to come out very soon? Yes, I think they will, and I think the new commission responsible is right now giving a chapter on Armenia. Okay. Sorry, could you repeat that? Um, th there's been an investigation of Gazprom's and uh, potential uh, allegedly anti-competitive practices for the last couple of years now. And we have been expecting a, a statement of objections or a charge sheet in the American lingo um, uh, to come out in May of this year and we're still waiting. And, and I was asking Michael, who is a very close observer of the EU, whether he expected one very soon and he said yes. And, and you expect a new commissioner to be tougher than the previous commissioner. Let me um, uh, start on this for a second, but um, look at it from this perspective. Um, if Europe's market is actually declining and the fastest growing gas market in the world is in Asia, and if you have a total of 14 BCM of export capacity to that market, and you have a potential to add 38, and maybe you know the last agreement with China comes through, but it's gonna take another 10 years, and you were cash-strapped, and you were under sanctions, and you had limits on how much you can depend on international finance, would you spend that capital, if you were a rational actor, on a 40 to 50 billion dollar pipeline, I mean, exactly how much is it's going to cost depends on whether you're building two lines or four lines. Um, or would you spend it on creating connectivity with Asia? Right. Put it in that perspective, it seemed pretty clear if you're going back to Thane's second point that um, as conservative as Gazprom might be, that they do have a rational business model somewhere that that will be a driving factor. I think understanding that also helps point to some of the tensions that you see internally within Russia's own energy and gas system and why Igor Sechin and Rosneft has made such a strong play for competition um, in the management of Russia's gas resources and the export of those resources, where Gazprom has been seeking the authorization to have the right to export LNG and has received the right to, to actually do so. Right? It's part of that, that drive toward diversification. Um, there are European companies, including any, who are contractors of Gazprom. And the, the way that the contracts have been structured is that the European partners actually bear no risk. Um, they, they get paid for services, and all of the risk is on Gazprom's part. So from their perspective, if it goes forward, they make a lot of money, and if it doesn't go forward, well, it, it's, they lose those services, but they're not an equity partner, right? So they're not investing resources. What's happened up to now uh, where the European Commission, the Energy Commission, has essentially said 
that the intergovernmental agreements across the countries across Southeast Europe that have been negotiated do not comply with the European Union standards. And as a result of that, the European Commission is not actively considering any of the requests for permits that Gazprom has made for South Stream, the South Stream pipeline. And what Commissioner Ettinger basically said is that my inbox is closed until you resolve that problem. If you resolve that problem, then we can have a conversation. So I think that the possibility of building South Stream is an uphill struggle. I don't think it makes a lot of commercial sense from Russia's perspective. I'm not quite sure that it makes a huge amount of sense for Europe's energy security, and I'll end on this, because if you think of the past, the gas relationship between Europe and Russia was largely almost a monopolistic relationship between a supplier on one side, a consumer on the other side, and you had one pipeline, largely one pipeline, mostly Ukraine, as Ed said, connecting the two. That pipeline became actually the control for a monopoly relationship. Um, what changes is if around that pipeline, it's not going to go away, those gas relationships aren't going to go away, but if you have dozens of LNG gas terminals, if you have gas coming in from Norway, and to just to get this a sense of scale, I mean, in 2012, Statoil exported more gas to Europe than Gazprom did, right? So Gazprom's become, uh, Statoil's become a serious player here. Algeria coming from the south, Libya, which had exported a lot and obviously hasn't during the Civil War, and you then look at a changing global gas market, as Thane was saying, it doesn't, that doesn't take away Russia as a supplier, but it puts Russia in a different position. It has to compete. What South Stream does not do is add to competition. It creates another route. It cuts out Ukraine. But if competition is fundamental to energy security, South Stream doesn't give it to you. Yes, please. Uh, listening to your description of the gas market uh, made me recall how, uh, how much uh, the economy relied on barter uh, of a whole range of commodities, uh, at least in the uh, immediate post-Soviet era. And uh, you spoke of monetarization of the economy. Does that mean that barter uh, has... Uh, really declined as a factor in uh, Ukraine's economy, or is it still important? Well, I have a vivid memory of driving from Moscow to Kiev in around 1992 and seeing as you got closer to Kiev, people actually lined up by the sides of the road selling things like pots and pans. And it turned out that they worked for the uh, dawn of communism pot and pan factory, and they were paid in pots and pans. And so they were desperate. They were standing there by the side of the road to find some way to recycle their pots and pans against anything else that drivers might, might be bringing to them. So that, I think, is the barter economy in its primitive beginnings. But then very quickly, it got very sophisticated as people built these chains of value, as we've described. And Gas was very much uh, central to that. But that, that era has very largely passed, I think, unless there are those of you with recent experience on the ground who can say that uh, we're, yeah, we're being it, naive and it, that it things It really left us the in the are. 1990s. Sorry? I mean, it really yes. left us in the 1990s. Right. I mean, yeah. there was an original you know, rationale, uh, which is that uh, uh, Turkmenistan had gas, it wanted to sell, it had goods and services, it wanted to buy. They, uh, neither Ukraine nor um, uh, Turkmenistan were particularly cash economies at, at the time, so there were middlemen companies that, that stepped in. That virtually disappeared uh, uh, during their period uh, it, uh, of, of the 1990s. Now they both operate uh, on cash. So, so, so the question goes, uh, on corruption at least, go way beyond barter. If you have Gazprom, a state 
state-owned and controlled company, majority state-owned company, selling gas to Naftahaz, a 100% state-owned uh, uh, company. What do you need a middleman for? There is absolutely no economic rationale for a middleman other than they are very good at facilitating transfer of funds into the right places. And of course, one last point on all this, the Turkmens no longer need to sell gas at cut rate prices to Turkmenistan, be, uh, to uh, Ukraine, because they can sell it to the Chinese, and that's been a major new element, which leads me to a question for Ed. I just want to know how long you left President <coughs> Kuchma uh, before telling him that you were not the Chinese ambassador to <laughs> Ukraine. Well, I, I won't answer that because I, 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 I like to keep a mystery about me. Uh, but but, but I, I think that there's an important uh, uh, point on, on, on South Stream to be made, and, and, and let me put it in, in, in more blunt terms than, than uh, uh, the elegance that uh, Carlos portrayed it. South Stream is a political project. It's not an economic project. Uh, it's an economically suboptimal project. And Russia has a perfectly good track record, it's a perfect track record, of doing economically suboptimal projects. So I would not bet against South Stream. Uh, uh, and, and I've stopped doing that uh, ever since they built Blue Stream, which was also an economically suboptimal project. Uh, but, but the point to be made for Europe's energy supply is that there are only two means of paying for an expensive infrastructure project. Either the gas producer pays, or the gas consumer pays. And, and th there's only two source sources of, of, of funds then uh, on that. And, and going back to what are the commercial terms that allow uh, uh, Europe to protect its energy security and economic competitiveness, as, as Thane said, that's really the, the test for South Stream. Uh, it, it, it seems to me. And, and um, we will see how steadfast this new commission will be in following its own rules uh, and, and, and regulations. Yes, go ahead. My name is Nick Wondra and I'm from the U.S. Department of Energy. I've heard a lot of a discussion in different panels today about the urgent need for financial and political support of Ukraine. Let's assume for the moment that it's not forthcoming, either from the EU or the United States. What is a set of second best policy alternatives that can be enacted in Ukraine to improve energy security and ensure that the livelihoods of people in Ukraine are better than they would be otherwise? I'd like to ask Carlos to take the first shot at that because I know he needs to leave. So can you answer that and then we'll try to do cleanup after you go? Um, sure. Um, look, um, I think first of all, um, the, the solutions that have to be put in place in Ukraine are fundamentally commercial solutions. But there are short-term transitional issues that have to be dealt with. And a basic part of those short-term transitional issues has to deal with the ability to buy gas. And because Ukraine is in the middle of a war, its economy has contracted. And it is deeply in need of international assistance from the IMF, from the World Bank, from the EU, from bilateral donors. And if anybody tells you that they can get by and not without that kind of international assistance, they're lying because it is impossible for them to be able to run their economy and deal with the balance of payments challenges in front of them unless they have external support. And you have to have that clear in our minds. In the near term, one of the issues that they're facing is how to purchase gas, either gas purchases from Western Europe. For example, they have a contract with Statoil, which is at a, um, the amount of gas that they're buying is about 10 billion cubic meters a year. That gas is actually moving through Slovakia. 
Um, it's indicative of the, the depth of change that has actually occurred in the European gas transit and marketing system that Ukraine can actually buy gas from Norway and get it delivered. It's actually not even getting directly to Ukraine. It's traded and swapped throughout the system. So the gas that actually gets into Ukraine, you know, God knows where it comes from, probably does come from Russia, but that's not where it originated. But those kinds of contracts and the prepayment with Russia are going to cost resources, and Ukraine is going to need a bridging tool to be able to get through this. So I, I think we just got to put that straight on the table. There are things that Ukraine has done. They've created an anti-crisis group to look at ways in which they can compress and restrain demand as necessary, and to do that in an orderly fashion rather than a crazy fashion. They have asked the United States and Europe for assistance. Um, there's been some to some extent, but it really needs to be all the time, full time, really looking at what are some of the most rational allocations of gas that they might have in a constrained type of environment. And I think they need more assistance there. And then finally, I think the other critical question is frankly going to be what kind of help and support we can give to the Ukrainian government in the near term to be able to improve their capacity to pr produce gas. There has been a lot of assistance that has been put on the table by the United States, by the EU, by the EBRD. There are practical things that can be done. The teams need to be built up to do it. And one of the reasons this is so critical is it creates a fundamentally different perspective on the negotiations. If you're dealing with a short term from the perspective that in five years or 10 years, you can create an environment for independence, then you have some degree of leeway and leverage in those discussions. If you're in these negotiations from a perspective that in two to three years you're going to be knocking on the same door all over again, then you don't have a lot of leverage. Okay? So if we're going to help build Ukraine, build that leverage, the long term and the short term are not disconnected from one another. They have a relationship. And we need to be able to help them keep an eye on the ball, not just on the short-term crisis, but where they're going to go. Otherwise, they will never get out of this mess. On that, we need to end um, because we are over time. Oh, all right. We'll okay. let Ed have the last word. Uh, I, I guess I will argue with your assumption. I, I, I think it's fair to say that Western strategy needs to assess what our own interests are in having a prosperous and democratic uh, Ukraine surviving uh, uh, as, as a state. And, and once we've decided what that is, then we need to have a clear-eyed and hard-headed uh, look at what needs to be done uh, in order to support Ukraine. It's, it's I think, uh, and, and hopefully that's the subject of the next panel, that is insufficient to keep saying that we support Ukraine without the kind of real assistance that Ukraine needs and we all know Ukraine needs, then, then we have an empty policy rather than a, a real policy. Please join me in thanking this very distinguished panel.